we've got quite a program today and a good turnout, so I'm going to turn the program over to the moderator. She's the chair of our committee who's been working on this project now for about six months, Amanda Pelsch. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone to the first public forum, Will the City of Santa Barbara Return to District Elections? We don't know that yet. There's lots of speculation. And <clears throat> yes, I am Amanda Pelch, and yes, I am the chair of this study. It's always a fun thing to do. Studies are what the league is about. I'm also the new treasurer for our league, and I wanted to state that our wonderful long-term treasurer, Jean Ritchie, has had to resign due to health reasons. So she will be very missed, and I pledge that I will do my utmost to keep those books straight. She's done a wonderful job. Now, our program. In an email that I sent out over the weekend, I stated to our speakers, one thing is certain, whatever we did not plan will happen. And yes, that's true. It did. Several things happened. Unfortunately, Ariel Colon contacted us yesterday, just about 24 hours ago, sick with the flu, with a high fever. No, we do not want him here. He needs to be home resting. So we're very sorry that he can't be with us because he plays an important part in this uh, situation. Uh, <clears throat> first, I want to give, I'll introduce our speakers in one moment, but first I want to give you a little bit of information about the league and some background. Why we're doing this, obviously. Late spring 2014, last year, it became apparent that the city of Santa Barbara was going to be sued on the, the California Voting Rights Act of 2001. We really didn't know what that meant, to be perfectly frank, but we knew we needed to know. So, some of you who are league members will know that in our league directory, we publish our positions. Positions are the directing force of the League of Women Voters. We have national positions, we have state positions, and we have local positions. In our directory on page seven, if anyone uh, of our members happens to have your directory here today, the lovely blue directory, which should be replaced before June, uh, <clears throat> under the chapter heading government, subchapter city charter, we have a position that supports a council manager form of government for Santa Barbara, and now I quote, with responsibility for administration concentrated in the city administrator and at large selection, election, I'm sorry, at large election of council members. So we have a stated position that currently supports at large elections. The policy was developed in the late 60s and adopted in 1968. And that was following a very contentious period on our city council that, and we had districts at that time. As a native Santa Barbaran, I remember that only too well. I was in college and it was like, what are they doing? Anyway, so the league at that time did what it does best. We did an extensive study and decided that we thought at-large elections would be the best to support the city of Santa Barbara as opposed to the districts. Now, coming up to the contemporary time, knowing that there was a lawsuit pending to return the city to district elections, at the league's annual meeting, June 14, 2014, the membership asked that a committee be formed to consider whether we should change our position or keep it. During the summer, our committee began to meet, and we have met about twice a month since then, trying to understand the legal and social ramifications of these two methods of voting. Now, 
I want to introduce our uh, committee members. Shane Stark, who will be speaking shortly, Vicki Allen, Lindsay Baker, Betsy Kramer, Susan Shank, Marty Bloom, Connie Hanna, and myself. We, everyone has worked very hard to gather this information and make it cogent because it's confusing. There's a lot of conflicts. Things don't line up quite as neatly as we might like them to. So we decided to try to present what we have learned on these subjects and educate all of us about the issues. To do that, we invited uh, two respected attorneys, Ariel Colon, our city attorney, and Shane Stark, retired county counsel. As I stated, Mr. Colon is not with us today. And we have added... Uh, Christine Schmidt, who is the, I want to give you her exact title, Director of Administrative Services. She will be involved in how this comes about. She hasn't arrived yet, but she will be here a little later. And Lucas Zucker, who comes from CAUSE, and will talk to us a little bit about some of the demographic and information about minority voting. We also have Jackie Enda, who is a member of the suit and has very specific and definite reasons why she wanted to join this suit and how she views the importance of district elections. She was very articulate when she spoke to our group and we were very happy to have her with us today. And then last but not least is our former mayor Sheila Lodge who is a long time member of the league and as many of you may know she uh, has spoken out about keeping at large elections whether that'll happen or not is still to be decided um, and now I want to make one short statement about league the League of Women Voters was formed in 1920 with the express purpose to help new voters, especially women, to learn more about the issues and to encourage them to use their new franchise. They were just receiving the vote. We, as women, were just receiving the vote. As the years went by, it was easy to see that minorities needed the same kind of help, and the League has always, and I emphasize always, tried to guarantee that all eligible citizens would receive nonpartisan information and be free to vote. So that is the probably the highest mantra for the League of Women Voters, is making sure that everyone gets to vote and has good, clear information. Now we need to ask ourselves whether district elections would help our underserved population to vote and to be able to win elections. Our first speaker today will be Shane Stark. As I stated, he's retired county counsel, longtime attorney, was immensely important to our committee because he was our legal beagle. <laughs> Have you ever been called a legal beagle or a legal eagle? Anyway, he did the research for us that made it possible to understand all of the ramifications. And one of the things that he says about himself is that he loves the Voting Rights Act more than anything other than his wife and children. Shane Stark. Would you prefer? Love Wolf. Wolf. <laughs> that's, that's what legal beagles allegedly sound like. Although, as the former owner of a couple of legal beagles, or guardian, if you prefer, uh, they're named because after the French for incessant howling. A, a vocal utterance, which hopefully I will be able to spare you. I won't howl. Thank you. Uh, I'm not the city attorney. You can tell because I'm not wearing a tie. I guess I could, I could borrow Joe's tie if I absolutely needed to, but I don't think that should be necessary. Um, I have a great deal of empathy, I should say, for the position of the city attorney in, in this matter. 
Some of you not versed in the arcana of, uh, should pardon the expression, public attorney ethics, we should understand that the city attorney has a duty, has a duty to defend a law that was approved by the voters. There's a extremely nasty, uh, about 1980s vintage uh, court of appeals case, which not so subtly tell, asked the city attorney, did he really mean to turn his back on the voter approved statute? Not good. The city attorney doesn't have a choice. This, this charter amendment, not exactly the same as initiative, I think it was put on the ballot by the council, but it nonetheless was approved by the voters, and the city attorney does have the duty to defend it. There's two problems with that. Mr. Colon and recuperating probably is well aware of them. The first is that this sort of lawsuit under this statute is extremely expensive to defend. Yes, it is. It's hard, it's expensive to defend, and if you're representing the city, it becomes increasingly more defensive, uh, more expensive to defend the further on you get into the lawsuit. And here's the second flaw. He's very likely to lose the lawsuit because of the, of the, la of the language of the statute and what appears to be the, the prevailing judicial climate. That's a lot of money, and he, if the city loses, they will owe the plaintiffs attorney's fees. How much is probably up to the court, but the statute makes it mandatory, and it prohibits the city from recovering its cost if it wins. That's a big, uh, big uphill burden uh, that the city is facing. Now, uh, I should, let me tell you why I love the Voting Rights Act. It's the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Great statute. Uh, there's a movie out about uh, the, the, the historic march on Selma and uh, the, the landmark adoption of the Federal Voting Rights Act. What I like about it, and I was going to law school when it got adopted, so that was a big thing that was happening when, when I was going to law school was the Voting Rights Act. Um, there's two things I like about it. The first thing is that it reinforces, I think probably and should reinforce once and for all, the core notion of equality. It's an affirmative statement that everybody is equal. And the second thing that it reinforces is the primacy in our system of the right to vote. So that's a really admirable, admirable uh, piece of work. The third thing that I like about it, which many other people might not, uh, is that it sort of stands for an instance in which government actually worked. <laughs> and, and that people who make their living uh, working for government and serving government can actually accomplish something that's generally considered to be beneficial to the society as a whole. That's why I like the Voting Rights Act. I'm not a big fan of the California Voting Rights Act. I'll tell you why. Because it's, ex it's expensive to defend, and the bet, if you lose, is so onerous that it's very difficult for a city attorney to make a reasonable decision to defend an ordinance. Because in order to, to, to um, defend a claim under the Federal Voting Rights Act, the court has to go through an extremely complicated and rigorous set of, of um, tests that are they're not intended to be easy, but they're intended to be, to walk a very fine line between having to prove that an entity intended to discriminate against a class of people, which you don't have to do anymore under, under the Federal Voting Rights Act, and to show that the results of a political system are in fact depriving a protected class of an effective full opportunity to participate in the system and get elected. That called for a searching inquiry by the judge into 
the political climate of a jurisdiction, the motivation behind what happened and why. Judges hate it. People that have to defend it hate it because you have to put your whole jurisdiction on trial in an effort for the judge to divine whether a system that on the face of it um, affords people one person, one vote, is in fact violative of, 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 of the, of the uh, Voting Rights Act. It's, it's a difficult inquiry to make, and people don't like it. The California Voting Rights Act, which is a 2002 statute, I believe, if I'm not right, the waning days of the Gray Davis administration. It was a, should pardon the expression, wasn't sneaked through the legislature, it was legitimately passed through the, the, state, the state legislature because, I believe, of the difficulty and expense in proving the jurisdictions violated the federal act. So there's a reason there's a streamlined path. Um, I should tell you that there is some ambiguity in exactly how this Federal Voting Rights Act will be ultimately interpreted. There are some things that are pretty clear, and there are some things that are not clear. What's not clear is exactly what the elements of the violation are. It apparently incorporates some of the Federal Act, but not all of it. The other thing that is not clear is the extent to which judges are free to grant remedies other than district elections if they find that there has been a violation and a dilution of rights. Please don't ask me to predict. I cannot. I can only tell you there are issues. They have not yet been decided by the appellate courts. What has been decided is that the State Voting Rights Act is valid. It's constitutional under both federal constitution and the state constitution. If you, uh, I did hand you a little uh, dandy one page outline, or it's actually a two page outline. You'll notice that uh, there's a statement of the elements of a case under federal law. Uh, there's an interesting case which you should keep your eyes on that has been argued to the United States Supreme Court case, Supreme Court. Um, it, I believe the name of the case is the Alabama Black Legislative Caucus versus the state of Alabama, and it's a challenge to how the Alabama legislature is redistricted or was redistricted. The case is expected to turn I apologize for excessive arcana here. The case is expected to turn on the extent to which the court believes that demographics should dominate in a Voting Rights Act case. But what I think is ultimately the court is going to do is explain exactly how Federal Voting Rights Act Section 2 vote dilution cases are to be decided by the various courts. So I'd keep an eye on that, on that case. That's for Federal Voting Rights Act. I like to zoom over to districting now. I noticed Christy got here. I remember. See, you always show up. Um, I'm going to talk about the criteria for districting. And I would suggest that you might want to talk about the process the city is going to use starting with next Tuesday's city council meeting. Is that right? I don't know if we're going to get to next Tuesday, but it will certainly be next Tuesday. Well, one way or another, we're going to get to next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> what may happen along the way is almost entirely speculative, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, Pretty much everything that goes on with respect to drawing district lines in the state of California 
has to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. You will notice that is true of the drawing of congressional districts, of state legislative districts, and of local district lines drawn by both counties, cities, and, and special districts. There, the, the criteria for districting is pretty straightforward. I say pretty straightforward. And I'm getting some good news here, too. Districts have to be as equal in population as possible. It's a lot easier to get them equal now. The good news for folks in the city of Santa Barbara is that before the, that at the time, Santa Barbara County turned over control of municipal elections to the city. Before they did that, they took the trouble to align the precinct boundaries with the census blocks which makes the process of drawing de district districts of equal population a lot easier and a lot more straightforward than it used to be. Uh, that's some good news. Equal in population, and they must comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. That's the only two mandatory requirements that there are for districts. There are a list of suggested factors uh, they're listed in the second page of your handy dandy handout. Uh, the suggested factors, I thought I had them, yes. The agency, the council, when I leave off to the, to the side, the interesting question about whether the city can appoint an independent redistricting commission that exercises the ultimate uh, ultimate authority to draw the districts. For that, you need a real city attorney uh, to interpret the, the actual city charter. Uh, you may consider topography, geography, cohesiveness and compactness of, this, of territory, and community of interest. That last factor, and community of interest, I believe, is defined in the state constitutional amendment that gave us the redistricting commission as social and economic factors that tie a, a community together. That, I suggest to you, is where the city can use the help of the public to the greatest extent is in defining what those communities of interest are how, both territorially, uh, culturally, and, and, and socially, so that the city will be able to ascertain that when they draw the districts. Equality of population is real simple. You use the latest census data, and you divide it by the number of districts that you have. In our case, it would be, I believe, the city is proposing six districts plus an at-large mayor gives you approximately 14,750 people, uh, more or less, uh, per, per district. Is that Mr. Cruz? Sorry, yeah, sure. How do we account for the people that are eligible to be citizens, that are residents of Santa Barbara, and that are The question is what to do when the census is undercounted. That's a good question. Usually you have a period of time within which you can challenge the census, and there are a couple of cases that give you a blueprint in making undercounting claims. I think ordinarily I would tell you that boat has sailed, except that we are in a situation where the districts would be drawn for the first time. So I, don't, I, I wouldn't give you an absolute no on that. Excuse me. I didn't address questions, but questions will be addressed at the end. There will be a short segment after each speaker for a few questions. Otherwise, there will be no questions during the discussion or during the information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I sense that I've, I've, I've uh, excessively used up the time. I would like to tell you a couple things. One, uh, I w it's our intent to make a, a long, or not all that long, but significant uh, reference material available giving uh, various sides and, and perspectives uh, on this issue, and we'll put it on the League's website. Uh, three things broke down that prevented it from being available today. The first was my printer, the second was my computer, and the third was me. Uh, 
but we'll, we'll get it up when we'll get it up when we can. Another thing that I got uh, two things I would particularly call to your attention. Uh, if you go on Kathy Murillo's website, KathyMurillo.org, is that your website, Kathy? Yeah. So yeah, I got. It. You will find, you scroll down to the end, you will get to a 2011 article in the Santa Barbara Daily Sound, it used to be a newspaper, that basically says, do we need uh, Latino representation on the city council? I suggest to you that's a very interesting and informative article. You can get it, it's got the statements by a broad spectrum uh, of people proponents of district elections, opponents of district elections, uh, Latinos and, and others, but I commend it to you uh, for the, uh, an example of the, the debate uh, that has been going on in the, the uh, community. The last thing I, I want to mention to you is that there may or may not be uh, a ballot measure um, in, in, in November. Uh, it is possible the judge will take, take matters out of the hands uh, of the voters and, and order district elections. The judge may wait. No one knows. Uh, if there is going to be a ballot measure, we will be having a forum. I would suggest to you that in addition to district elections, other jurisdictions have found ways to increase minority representation on their governing bodies, which after all I think is a, a main point uh, in the effort for district elections is to ensure uh, that uh, communities, uh, protected communities are indeed represented so their cultures and their viewpoints can be, can be heard on, on, the gov on the governing body. Uh, they include, include cumulative voting in which you get a number of voter, uh, votes but you can target them for one or two candidates. Um, concentrating your votes. Um, there's a system that's used in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which I do not understand, but I, I urge you to look up. It's a, kind of a trickle-down choice voting that it's uh, proffered as, a, as an alternative to winner-take-all elections. It seems to work on Cambridge. Maybe that's because they have too many universities there and they, and they couldn't figure out any other way to do it. I'm told that when they first invented this system, it was extraordinarily difficult to administer, but now with computers, it works a lot easier. Uh, and there's some merit to that. Uh, uh, last but not least, I understand we have a distinguished speaker on this. We're going to talk, you could think about moving the date of the election so that Santa Barbara's elections are conducted in even years rather uh, than odd years, which I'm guessing our next our speaker is going to tell us increases voter turnout substantially. Anything else? Mickey. Wait, we need, I'm sorry, we have, uh, we need the um, microphones for asking questions. It's been bandied about, uh, and maybe it's incorrect, that this California Voting Rights Act, rather than requiring any proof or even indication of intent to discriminate simply says that there is an a priori discrimination if a protected class has not had representation on the governing body for a long time or in general. And no other evil intent has to be proved. And apparently in court decisions recently, that is the only thing that has had to be demonstrated. Is that right? I'm not sure whether that's right. That's close. That, that's, that, that's close. There are some nuances which, which may have been missed. It is true in neither the federal act nor the state act is intent to discriminate required. What is true under the federal act is something called the results test, which is, as I indicate, requires an examination of, the, of a jurisdiction's uh, political ethos to, determinate, to determine if a discriminatory, a discriminatory animus pervades the jurisdiction. The State Voting Rights Act, the California Voting Rights Act, was upheld by the appellate courts 
as an anti-discrimination law. The word discrimination does not appear in that statute. What, but what does appear is a statement that you violate the act if there is racial polarization as defined in the federal law, which is a little bit slippery there, which can mean anything from, well, a protected class voted for one candidate and the, ma the majority voted for another candidate, thus blocking the protected class from getting its representatives. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that all or part of the analysis that are required in the federal act is incorporated in the state act. The courts have yet to rule on that point. Is that close enough? One more question, then we have to move on to our next speaker. Pat Shusick. Okay, I consider myself a self-appointed neutral observer since I'm in the county. And I would like to know if there's any way that the population of an area varies. Because, if, for instance, in LA, they have districts that have over a million people, and here we only have 80,000 in the whole city. And it seems to me there's a big difference between the representation in a small city versus a large one. And, and indeed, that may be a, 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 an interesting polit political point, the law does not particularly distinguish between large jurisdictions and small jurisdictions. They simply requires that if you have districts that they need to be equal in population. Thank you, Shane. We appreciate this very much. Um, oh, there she is. I was looking for Christy when I talked to her uh, about a quarter of 11 this morning. So we've been moving around a lot uh, because of her schedule. She was willing to come, but I told her then if she was able to be here when Shane was finished, that we would do her second, and then we'll have Jackie, Lucas, and uh, Sheila Lodge. So Christy is the Director of Administrative Services for the City of Santa Barbara. She's also an attorney and <clears throat> will talk to us about potential process for the city. Christy? Thank you so much. Um, and I'm sorry that Ariel Colon couldn't be here today. He was really looking forward to it. Uh, we talked about it just last week uh, to addressing you. And unfortunately, I'm, hello, Joe Allen. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm not as versed in the legal ins and outs and, and the city's case um, w related to district elections. Um, what I have been involved in is the um, uh, designing of a process to get input from the public on how exactly, if we were to go to district elections, how those districts would be drawn and how um, the process would be phased in uh, for the city. So uh, initially, uh, up until uh, just a few weeks ago, our intent had been to hold a um, process starting in uh, February, which would go to would ha happen at the Faulkner Gallery and, and allow everyone to come in and, and help us with two main questions. One would be if we did go to district elections, um, how would we like to see the process un unwind? So how would we like to uh, put together a blue ribbon panel, if it was a blue ribbon panel, to draw the district boundaries. And then the second question is, once the district boundaries were drawn, how would we phase in district elections? Would we start with just the two districts that were upcoming? Would it be uh, just start all over with district elections immediately? So how would that phase in? And all of that was contingent on the idea that we had some time to talk about this, that we would be putting uh, a ballot measure on the 2015 ballot uh, to say whether we should go, ask the public whether we should go to district elections, and um, if so, uh, should we use this it, it, this um, district drawing process that we've developed with the public's input. Um, Unfortunately, since then, um, we found out that the, the judge in the case has, has set a trial date for April, uh, and the comments were that we would be moving forward uh, 
the, the, that the decision would be made in time to move forward with district elections, not in 2017, but in 2015. And that significantly moves our timeline forward for um, uh, gathering public input for how, how these districts are going to look. So we have not finalized exactly what this is going to look, look like, but um, the city is committed and the city council is committed to having as much input from the public as possible into the process to inform the city's position in both the litigation and in potentially settlement discussions with regard to district elections. Um, so um, at minimum, we believe this is going to involve within the next couple of months several workshops. Um, uh, we tentatively have one scheduled for the 28th of um, February at the Faulkner Gallery on Saturday. Uh, to, but, and the content of what we'll be doing there, uh, we're not entirely sure of, but it will involve some level of um, presenting uh, some example maps and having the ability to draw boundaries and, and come up with alternative maps for districts within the, within the city. So not pretty vague uh, about exactly what this process is going to look like. We are planning to go to the city council. It probably will not be the 27th, but the third with the outline of a plan for public input so that we will have at least um, going into the litigation, going into any sort of settlement discussions, some sort of direction from the public about what they would like to see with regard to that. Um, so any questions or? Yes. Hi. If the uh, first elections by district were to be held in November 2015, does that really give enough time for a, in your opinion, or you may not want to volunteer an opinion, I'll say in my opinion, it doesn't give enough time for the kind of public uh, process that you're talking about to draw the maps, uh, and to develop a procedure. Do you think there's leeway in this process for uh, saying let's begin uh, the first district elections, let's say in 2016, and what would it take to bring about that kind of uh, timetable? I think that would be, uh, you know, that would be up to the the litigants, uh, and would be based on um, uh, either a decision from the judge or uh, based on settlement negotiations. So that would be between our attorneys and the attorneys um, for the litigants. Uh, but at this point, I think that the the judge has indicated that that, you know, at least preliminarily, the the target would be 2015. Yeah, one uh, question, and you've mentioned settlement negotiations. Do you know whether or not the city of Santa Barbara could, without a vote, as part of a settlement negotiation, move elections to 2016 and create districts at that time? I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. No. I'm sorry. And, and I should mention, I am an attorney, but I don't practice law for the city, yeah. so I'm not involved in the legal case uh, in, on this end. One more. Okay. Um, can the judge decide that at-large elections are just fine? I mean, is he got that kind of sway, or is it this is just going to be a decision on how to do districts? Um, I think that that that, that sure. Uh, I think that you know, as as uh, Mr. Stark said. Uh, uh, Lots of cases have not gone that way, um, but but certainly I think that that the 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 judge part of it could be the this, the decision could be that that not to do district elections to keep the elections as they are today. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. We we appreciate you coming at such nor short notice and helping us out. Great. There's your sandwich. Okay, our next speaker is Jackie Inda, and she passed out and had some of her staff pass out some uh, very good information that she has on uh, why district elections are so important in our area. So Jackie will tell you a little bit about herself. We're very happy to have her with us today. Jackie. Jackie. 
Okay, guys, I am not here to talk about the legal case, and I'm not an attorney, so I can't answer legal questions, but I can give you a little bit of history of what's gone on in the city and identify some key things that you have in front of you. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history, but I'm also not going to talk a lot because to, to do that. Uh, so I'd like to share with you what you have in front of you so that you understand what you're going home with and so that you can do some research because to me an educated decision is based on your own research and knowledge of information. So what you have in front of you, the very first thing, is something that was a measure in the 90s. Does everybody see? So we made about 50 of these. I'm not sure the number of people here, but maybe we could share with the person next to you. No, it looks like there's about four per table, maybe, and there's about 50. Anyway, so. I'm sorry. I want to make a quick statement. I'm sorry. Jackie's uh, person came in and was handing these out. Some of our people who were watching the flow of things didn't realize that he was actually here at our speaker's, requ requ speaker's request. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry about that. Please apologize to him for us. Mm -hmm. It was a miscommunication. And uh, if you want these, we will see that you get them. But we'll need your name, phone number, contact information. OK. So. You, uh, one of the things that um, happened, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. In the 90s, we had something called Measure S. It was a bipartisan approach to try to get districts into the city. That did not pass. And in fact, back then, the people who put it together and tried to initiate it with, were founders of La Casa, which was an organizing uh, uh, organization here in Santa Barbara. Um, both Leo Martinez and uh, Mr. Capello, who was an attorney, were close friends at that time, and even discussed looking at the Federal Voting Rights Act back then. Um, we decided to go ahead and move forward with a measure. Of course, I say we because I wasn't around back then. But in, in, in and around this time, people really wanted to uh, push for district elections for more even uh, representation. and. Of course, it failed. It failed by about 400 uh, votes with bipartisan support. And it was learned then, or one of the things that you take back from that is the fact that sometimes when you have something like racially polarized voting, you can't expect the voter population to change the demographic just based on. And you can't actually um, put that kind of task on people without them fully understanding what racially polarized voting is. And so. In 2001, I know that you guys have heard a lot about MALDEF and the creation of the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. In 2001, they initiated and spearheaded, uh, along with other folks, the California Voting Rights Act. And um, of course, there were a few things. I know that this uh, presentation has talked a little bit about fees. But the reason why the fees were included in the Voting Rights Act is so that we could have a quicker process. Cities did not want to really look at racially polarized voting or California Voting Rights Act or even federal Voting Rights Act violations. So they dragged on the legal process for years before any remedies were created. And so the fees were really established in the California Voting Rights Act to be able to have that pressure, per se, to identify Voting Rights Act violations, move forward a process so that we wouldn't drag it on for years and continue to have elections that would continuously create um, racially polarized voting. And the other thing, of course, is that it identified that districts are the solution to voting rights uh, violations by the CVRA standards. So local leaders followed this. Uh, folks from Capello's office actually followed this a little bit. But as a community, we weren't quite ready to go into the path of a lawsuit then. In 2007, which is actually the next thing you have 
so re if you look at the packet, if you have maybe one per table, the first thing you have is um, the old measure. The next thing is a quick little snippet information about the, Col the, the California Voting Rights Act. And then after that, you have something called a grand jury report. In 2007, there was a grand jury investigation. Okay, and I'm not going to go into the details of it because I don't want to bore you. This is a little bit more education on your part. And you can actually go on to the website and get this type of information yourselves to give yourself a little bit more education. But at that time, there, were, there was a report created and presented to the city council identifying that we may have racially polarized voting in the city of Santa Barbara. And very, very simple things like changing commissions and committees were things that they requested in their report to make significant changes to be able to address something called viable candidacy and being able to build up those kind of candidates that we needed to represent equally in our community. Of course, at that time, no changes were made. And city council, um, still to this day, could make changes to commissions and committees, like our mayor says, any given Tuesday. And yet none of those changes were created. And so around 2009, we all know that there was a big spike in youth violence. Uh, and a lot of neighborhoods and community families got together to try to ask for systemic changes in our city from the neighborhoods that were mainly impacted by youth violence. Time went by during those fights and discussions about trying to make some kind of positive changes. None of the actual systemic changes that um, were requested, even working with a youth in a family component, were, were taken up. And the funding structures and things like that were never modified to create the kind of systemic changes that the neighborhoods were requesting. Rather, the city went ahead and filed a, a gang injunction, which we know the outcome of that now after three years of fighting in that litigation process, the city lost the very first gang injunction in the nation in the civil process, which could have been, um, I would say, one of the key factors of my involvement with the district elections committee. And it's because our community has constantly, for years, voiced concerns and voiced possible changes in our system whether it's electoral or not, that we have to address, and yet none of those changes have come about. And so, uh, and let me just go back a little bit. Um, in 2013, the District Elections Committee came about. They actually formed as a group. They started doing some research in regards to the local area California Voting Rights Act the possible violations, and CVRA. What you have after the grand jury investigation report is an article that talks a little bit about um, the city's comments about possible identifying factors of racially polarized voting. And that's really what it comes down to. And what the, the factor here is that the question, or the question at hand, is do we have racially polarized voting? Will a judge determine if we have racially polarized voting, and how do we resolve that? Well, we resolve that with district elections. And so if you actually take some time and look at the city council videos, you'll see that some of the discussions from the expert in the preliminary reports had some what they called gray uh, fabrics in, in identifying maybe racially polarized voting even before the full reports were coming through. And so, because we had done our research, we went to city council. And we said, look, you potentially might have a lawsuit on your hand. Before we even file a lawsuit, we want you to know that we've done our research, we've done our homework. We have history here of community coming and gathering and asking for changes that have not been addressed yet. And so, um, we had a forum in October of 2013 we had council members there, people who were elected into office, our mayor, and it was specifically on district elections asking, what kind of remedies or what do you think about district elections? In March of 2014, we held a workshop here actually, bringing in leaders from other cities that had already gone through the process of district elections, and again, trying to let people know you've got a situation here and you've got some time to try to maybe put that on the ballot, right? And try to push for some kind of public process because we could have 
filed a lawsuit in that process, but we went ahead and tried to open dialogue. In June of 2014, it wasn't, well, let me back up. It wasn't until June until, of 2014 when this, uh, with Capella went up to city council and said, hey, look, you need to do something here. And it was having somebody from that category addressing city council that pushed city council to open up dialogue. And after that, the city council went ahead and had their public workshop. They informed the community of that. Um, and the city attorney actually gave them an outline and a timeline in which they could quickly respond, put something on the ballot along with ballot language to put it on that November ballot. Of course, knowing that, the city council at that point decided to do a couple of things. They decided not to put it on the ballot. They decided to go ahead and study and research racially polarized voting for themselves to come up with um, maybe a, an outcome. Of course, at that workshop, they also um, quickly decided to hire an expert but did not pay for it. They did not go back until and into agenda on city council until July, which is way past the filing deadlines and the, and the timeline that the city attorney gave them to fund the research. So of course, what comes after that, we went ahead and filed a lawsuit. So the reason why I give you that history is because sometimes people ask the question, well, why a lawsuit? Why not open it up to the public? And for the, for the years that we've been fighting social inequalities and justice in the city, we've identified things that we, that we have clearly tried to push forward. And it wasn't until Capello's office decided to step forward in city council that they even decided to open up a dialogue, even though they had the opportunity to before that. And so we're in a legal process now. So I'm not here to try to make a point for district elections because we have a lawsuit pending and the outcomes will become public. The racially polarized voting will be something that's public record. And that's something that comes out of a judgment in, in April. Now, I know a lot of people have talked a little bit about even years and things like that. The remedy for racially polarized voting based on the CVRA is district elections. And so if by the information that you have in front of you and you do a little bit of research and listening to what's going to happen in April, you can identify that we do have racially polarized voting and the judge will make the decision on district elections. You have until June, from what I understand, as a League of Women Voters to change your position to support at large or even or, or um, district elections, right? Um, the reason why that's important is because you have some time to research and find out what exactly really has gone on. And then you make your position based on the information that you have, based on critical information of racially polarized voting. And why is that important? Because it's the league. You're one of the only organizations that is nonpartisan that could sit down, listen to candidates, talk about registration of voters, and doing all of those good things based on getting people the right to vote. Okay, so your position won't change until June, and our hearing process will end in April. So you have the public record and public information during that time that will identify racially polarized voting in which then you can make your choice, right? So why am I here? I'm here, not to change your mind, but the last handout that you have is just a newspaper article, because I like to read a lot, apparently is a Long Beach article that was given to us um, of the benefits of district uh, elections, being able to identify candidates that are viable with every district, being able to do things that are radical in thinking for the city of Santa Barbara, like creating budgets per district, going in and changing something like commissions and committees to be reflective of every neighborhood so that when reports go back to a city council that's district-based, they have the kind of voice and representation that has been worked out through committees and commissions appointed by neighborhood. So what do districts really do for the community? It impacts every single neighborhood to be able to create the kind of changes that they want because they have a candidate that is elected to them. They have the ability to choose that candidate 
based on the needs that they need for that particular neighborhood. And most importantly, of course, the only reason why we're here is because it eliminates racially polarized voting. And so I understand that we do have a not large system right now. And I also understand that you will have a lot of information in April, a lot of information in which you can either choose to support violations of Voting Rights Act and continue to stay on the position at at large or change your position to districts and support raci eliminating racially polarized voting. Now, there are a lot of things that we could talk about. We could talk about remedy factors, like maybe going into even years. And in reality, those are all important. And we hope that it will be city council that maybe listens to some of those. I'm sure you guys have followed the news and you have heard Capello state in public hearing that we as plaintiffs are open to that. And the thing with talking to your city council representatives is that you can voice your concerns and say, hey, if we do have racially polarized voting, why not include even years as something out of settlement, save the money, and move this forward? And that's a conversation that you can have as an individual with your city council member, as groups, that you can say, hey, we want even years as part of a settlement. And your city council will have the ability to put that forward if they can in a settlement. It's very clear that in our position as plaintiffs, which is the only comment that I'll make as a plaintiff, is that we've made it very public, our attorneys made it very public. We are open to settling and we are open to settling into even years. But it does take city council to be that open as well. So um, anyway, again, moving forward, my, my benefit or my coming here today is really to talk about the next steps because April is only a skip and a hop away. Okay, so what we're really talking about is moving the conversation into voter registration, nonpartisan voter registration and bringing out the turnout. And if even years don't become something that comes up in the settlement, that we look at other options to try to get that on the ballot so we do have even years, so that everybody in this community is properly represented, that we have the registration of people up in those numbers because we have very low numbers in the city of Santa Barbara and that we can all work together to try to do a nonpartisan board registration. So anyway, I'm gonna let you be. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Now, we'll take two questions. Timing is okay. Once those questions are done, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and that'll put us back at between 120 and 125. So, cause a lot of times we just need a little quick break. So questions for Jackie. Okay. Yes. Um, yes, isn't there um, a danger of uh, what they call packing in a city the size of Santa Barbara if you uh, create a district that's based on, um, on race or working class and so on? And uh, also given the fact that there might be some type of comprehensive uh, immigration reform coming in the next year or so, and the fact that uh, there are a lot of young Latinos now in the population that are sort of sprinkled all over town, that they might be actually hurt by districts uh, because in an at-large election, given 38% of the population and the fact that it might grow, there's an opportunity to elect even more Latinos to the city council than the one that might be elected in a safe district drawn up by um, uh, districts. Right. Well. It's a little bit interesting because um, some of what you say, I, I believe, and that is to try to get people elected into office. But the reality is that the city of Santa Barbara does not have the sprinkle of Latino voters or protected class citizens, which is a whole category of individuals scattered throughout the city. We live in a population where you have um, big pockets and areas that have racial, uh, that have, um, racial fabrics that have all protected classes in them because of the income. And so when you have something like racially polarized voting and you create districts, you have the ability to be able to go back to that neighborhood and identify maybe viable candidates or bring up voter registration because people will get engaged in their neighborhoods. And so when it comes to districts, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but when you start to really do the research, which I'm sure it'll be open to the public if it goes through hearing that you have all this information, you're really looking at pockets, dense pockets of protected class citizens that have not been heard for many years. So this will bring that voice up to, to par. We have one more question over here. For, uh, wait for the mic, please, so we can pick this up. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. 
I would just add to Jackie's comment, Mr. Guy, you're talking about the Federal Voting Rights Act, Section 2, an abridgment to all voters. Say if you're stacking the chips on the east side, west side district, and you stack it over 50%, that, in essence, the majority of white Anglo-Saxons that are in here that are Santa Barbara voters could technically uh, sue because CVRA is race neutral. So when we become the supermajority in 10 years, not in voting class, what stacking represents is a form of reverse discrimination, which we as plaintiffs don't want because the Section 2 violation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take that short break, and then uh, after that, Lucas Zucker will talk to us, and then we'll conclude with Sheila Lodge. And uh, our web person, Bonnie Lassen, has gathered all of the information so that we can publish it on our website. And so everyone can come and, you know, you can go there and you can see it. Uh, we'll probably be putting up some other links as well. We haven't got quite that far yet. It just, it, all these things take time and research. Uh, <clears throat> okay, our next speaker will be Lucas Zucker, and Lucas was recommended to us because he has done a lot of research on voting and minority voting, so he'll talk to you about this. Lucas is with CAUSE, and Lucas, will you give us a little information about who you are? This, these things came so much at the last minute, I didn't actually have opportunities to get everybody's bio, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas Zucker, uh, and I work for Cause, uh, formerly known as Pueblo. Uh, maybe many of you in Santa Barbara are more familiar with that name. Uh, Pueblo slash Cause has really been the primary organization working to mobilize Latino and working class voters in Santa Barbara for many years. Um, and I personally am a researcher and I've done research into voting rights and voting issues in, uh, here in Santa Barbara as, as this process unfolded, but also in Ventura um, and in Santa Maria where CAUSE has been working as well to uh, do election reform. Um, so I want to talk about a really critical issue that hasn't gotten as much attention in the debate around district elections that a few of the other speakers have, have briefly mentioned, uh, which is the timing of elections. Um, and so. Overall, CAUSE believes that if, if done right, uh, district elections can help correct the long history of underrepresentation of Latinos on Santa Barbara City Council. Uh, however, um, if, if done poorly and hastily, um, this election reform can be deeply inadequate. So we support holding district elections in 2016 uh, on a presidential election where voter turnout is high. Um, rather than in 2015 when extremely low Latino voter turnout um, could make this entire reform really a failure. Um, so Latinos make up about 38% of Santa Barbara residents, as has been mentioned before, uh, which means district elections would likely give the city two majority Latino districts and likely another one that's, you know, has a significant Latino population but isn't a majority. Um, and much depends on how the lines are drawn. Uh, but we have to remember that district elections don't guarantee that the council members elected in those seats actually represent, reflect the districts that they represent. Um, so the big problem is that right now Santa Barbara holds city council elections on odd years, 2011, 2013, uh, instead of even years, 2012, 2014, um, when literally every other city um, and school district in Santa Barbara and Ventura County, uh, as well as every uh, county, state, federal election is held. Um, so voter turnout in these odd year elections is abysmally low, especially among Latino voters. Uh, in the last city election, only 26% of registered Latino voters cast ballots, um, compared to 40, 41% of whites. So, so roughly half, um, a little more than half of Latino voters, uh, voter turnout versus white voter turnout. Um, this is a far larger gap than you see in even numbered years. So in the 2012 election, 75% uh, of Latinos in Santa Barbara cast ballots and 83% of whites voted, uh, which is, you know, there's, there's still a lower Latino voter turnout in even years, but there's not as huge of a difference, um, not that glaring disparity that we see in the odd years. So you're looking at a situation where during odd year city council elections, everyone's voter turnout drops dramatically, but white voter, voter turnout drops by half while Latino voter turnout drops by two thirds. So as a result, Latino voters are massively underrepresented in these odd year elections. And so some have said that district elections are only for larger cities uh, and can't work in a smaller city like Santa Barbara. Uh, 
I would generally disagree with that. Uh, Santa Barbara is, is clearly large enough to have distinct neighborhoods. Um, there are about a you know roughly a dozen cities around Santa Barbara's size throughout California that have district elections, but. Uh, during these odd year city council elections, only around half of the voters that normally turn out in even year elections cast ballots. So meaning that implementing district elections in Santa Barbara um, without moving to even years would be like implementing them in a city half of Santa Barbara's size. So as I mentioned earlier, under district elections, Santa Barbara will likely have, would likely have two majority Latino districts and one kind of mixed district um, and three majority white districts. Um, but remember that a district could have a population that's 60 to 7 percent Latino, um, but still only have 40 to 50 percent of the population uh, who's eligible to vote be Latino. Um, and even worse, in an odd year election, could maybe only have 30, 40 percent of the actual voters who turn out to vote be Latino. Um, so you could have districts that are majority Latino that don't result in um, you know, adequate Latino voter representation without even year elections. Um, in the, major the two majority Latino districts likely to be created during an odd year election, voter turnout you know, will likely be in the 25% you know, range. Right? Um, and in a small city like Santa Barbara, this could mean you know, a candidate without wide grassroots support throughout the neighborhood who doesn't necessarily reflect the majority of the neighborhood's views and values um, could potentially win an election with only a few hundred votes uh, if there are enough candidates running. So in any and then in, in the districts that might have a, a mixed, kind of diverse population, um, we would likely continue to see an underrepresentation of Latino voters in an odd numbered year. Uh, and then Latino voters who live in white majority neighborhoods, which does exist, um, will be all but completely ignored, making up such a small portion of that district in an odd year election um, that candidates might consider them totally insignificant. Um, so, we feel that even year elections is critical to making district elections work in Santa Barbara, in, a, in any city like Santa Barbara. Um, and simply put, if you don't have the Latino voter turnout, um, then it, it defeats the purpose of having the districts. So if we're going to do district elections, we've really got to take this seriously and do it right. Um, and that looks like, you know, the, the direction things might be headed because of the, the difficulty of challenging a California voting rights lawsuit for the city. Um, so if, if it's headed down that direction, we strongly encourage you to contact city officials um, and urge them to, in the settlement, move to even years. Um, the, another reason why district elections should be held in 2016 instead of 2015, as was mentioned by uh, previous speakers, um, is that we need adequate time for everyday residents to voice their concerns and give public input into the district maps. What you don't want is districts that are drawn hastily in private, maybe by people who might have uh, you know, conflicts of interest um, who are interested in running those districts. Uh, you want a process that's open in the air, gives adequate time for you know, people to speak up about making sure that their neighborhood's adequately represented. Um, and then after the maps are drawn, it also takes time for leaders in these long underrepresented communities like the east side of Santa Barbara, like the west side of Santa Barbara, um, to organize grassroots support and engage voters in neighborhood issues which have long been ignored. Uh, the issue of odd year elections uh, also made national headlines this year when several major news outlets pointed to odd year elections in Ferguson, Missouri uh, as a key reason why black voters were underrepresented in city leadership. The, there's a reason that every other city in this region holds even year elections. Um, and that reason is that most people consider it a no-brainer. Uh, there's three major reasons. One, uh, as I mentioned before, odd year elections have incredibly low voter turnout. Uh, in fact, um, there's, there's been some folks who have, have wondered, well, what about the drop off that happens when, uh, you know, sure, it's a presidential year and a lot of people are turning out to vote, but do they really go all the way down the ballot and vote down to city council and school board? Um, well, I've pulled together some data, um, and unfortunately I didn't make uh, handouts for everybody, but I'd be happy to, to supply it to the, the league's email list. Um, but you can see... I'll make a deal. If you email this thing, when we get around to putting our material on the website, we will include the charts Perfect. and the data in the website Great. so everybody can see it. Thank you so much. Um, so you can see that we actually, interestingly enough, um, within the city limits of Santa Barbara, um, and I say within the city limits because the Santa Barbara Unified School District is actually bigger than the city limits, um, but within the city limits of Santa Barbara, actually more voters are casting ballots for school board in even year than are casting ballots for city council in odd years. Um, 
which is, which is really interesting because in most cities, school board has significantly lower voter turnout because, say, people like me who don't have kids go, oh, school board, who cares, right? Um, which they shouldn't, but they do, right? Um, but in Santa Barbara, that's flipped. And the reason is because of these odd year city council elections. Um, so, so yeah, so Santa Barbara has incredibly low voter turnout um, in, in these even years. Um, and, oh, sorry, what was that? Oh, sorry, in, in these odd years, in these odd years. <laughs> so, so that's, that's the first reason why everyone wants to increase voter participation, right? That's the first reason why most people consider uh, moving to even years a no-brainer. The second reason is that uh, all of the groups of people that traditionally have the lowest voter, voter turnout, even in even years, um, young people, people of color, low-income people, have even lower voter turnout in odd years. And you can see why this is, right? For example, if you are someone who, say, recently became a US citizen, you're a working mom, you work in Santa, one of Santa Barbara's many hotels, long hours, you've got a lot of responsibilities, um, but you, you, know, you really want to vote for the first time. Um, you might look at elections, and you know, during an even year election, uh, there's important state and national issues on the ballot. It's in the news every single day. This election's coming up. This is what's at stake. This is what matters. Um, on the other hand, um, in an odd year election, uh, you might not see anything in the news, right? We have a decline of local newspapers, local TV outlets. Um, you might not know there's an election. Um, even if you do, you might not know what issues are at stake. Um, you might not have any contact with anyone coming to your door and telling you, hey, remember to turn out to vote. Um, because the reality is these low-income neighborhoods are often the most ignored by candidate campaigns and, and the least you know, canvassed, the least phone banked. Um, so you might be really unlikely to know that there's an election or know that that election is important. So third, um, odd year elections are just expensive. Um, the city has to pay for its own separate election rather than pooling with the county. So uh, Santa Barbara right now has to pay around two to three hundred dollars per, or two to three hundred thousand dollars, sorry, uh, per election, um, rather than sixty thousand dollars that would be paid to the county to, you know, be be along with the even year elections. Um, and obviously, this is money that could spent, be spent on parks, libraries, public safety, fixing potholes. Um, for all of these reasons, uh, last year, with almost no controversy, voters in Ventura approved a switch to even-year elections by a landslide vote of 83% to 17%. Um, now that Ventura has made the switch, that was the last city in our region that had odd-year elections. So Santa Barbara will soon get to claim the embarrassing uh, title of having the lowest voter participation in city elections in really anywhere for about 100 miles around. Um, which would really be unfortunate. Um, so that's why we're urging a switch to even your elections uh, uh, as part of any potential settlement or, or anything else that moves forward. Um, and we have heard multiple times from members of the District Elections Committee um, that they support even your elections. But we're concerned that some city leadership is only interested in doing the bare minimum to avoid the city being sued, um, rather than seriously doing what's necessary to make sure that our elections work and that we have fair elections in Santa Barbara. So CAUSE urges the League and everyone here to support even your district elections starting in 2016, um, and ask the city council and mayor to support this as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. We appreciate it. Do we have two questions? Any questions? Thank you, Lucas. To make a change uh, from odd to even, can that be done legislatively, or do we have to go to a vote of the people? Uh, I believe the city council can uh, can just include it in the what they're you know what they settle with the district election committee, or I think the city council can actually just vote to do it um, independently too. Yeah. Do you know Kathy? Kathy. Mario is here, and do you know if the uh, city council can make that decision on its own? Thank you, and thank you to everyone who's, who's here and who's presented. Um, it's a charter amendment to change our electoral process, um, but right. because the lawsuit is going to the court, the court can order changes to our charter, uh, and so the, the judge, it's Donna Geck, uh, you know, she's going to look it all over and maybe even an even year switch will be part of the remedy. Well, you've convinced me, Zuka, uh, 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 Lucas, <laughs> today, uh, uh, 
but uh, since I have the mic, can I ask you just how did you, you said you did research. Can mm -hmm. you just tell us, did you get it, how did, how did you reach these conclusions? Because that's sure. a pretty bold statement that more people vote in school Absolutely. district elections in even year than city council in odd. That's amazing. It's, it's astonishing. And it's not, it's not just more, it's much more. I mean, it's 65,000 people within the city of Santa Barbara boundaries cast ballots for the Santa Barbara Unified School District in 2012, compared to only 49,000 for the city council. It's a huge discrepancy. Um, so, so yeah, I just looked at the, it's, it's actually public data. Uh, anyone can find it. Um, and it was a bit of a menial task. I had to, unfortunately, the, the county does not break it down by city, so I had to go and look at every single precinct within the city of Santa Barbara and add up how many votes were cast for <laughs> Santa Barbara Unified School District um, and, and add that all up and then compare that to the total voter turnout in 2013 um, and found that it was much more. Okay. But anyone's welcome to do that menial task all over again. <laughs> I'm not sure it was a menial task, but it took a lot of work, you know, and when you're crunching numbers like that, it's always amazing that they don't have better ways to crunch it. Thank you very much, Lucas. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Moving ahead, our last speaker today is Sheila Lodge, a longtime member of the league, former mayor, former city council. Uh, pardon? Yes, and she's back on the planning commission now. She was did that first before she again went to city council, and that was through league work that kind of encouraged her to do that. And now she's back doing that again. She's come full circle. And Sheila will be speaking to us about at-large elections. Thank you. Given that the provisions of the Voting Rights Act adopted by the state legislature in 2001 results in judicially imposed district elections under almost any circumstances, if a lawsuit is filed, uh, supporting at-large elections feels just a bit like speaking into the wind. However, the League needs to decide whether or not it is going to change its current position or or keep stay with it. And in the entrance, interest of good governance and better representation for all citizens based on the city's experience in the past with district elections and on an, almost e an equal amount of time with our large elections, I urge the League to maintain that position. However, uh, given what I understand the state legislature is considering right now, imposition of district elections on all cities in California over a certain size, the whole question may be moot. Well, when the question of uh, subject of district elections came up in the spring, I did a little bit of research. And as a result of the settlement of a lawsuit, uh, the city of Modesto shifted from at-large elections to district elections in 2009. Now, Modesto's population is more than double Santa Barbara's. It's about 204,000. White only is 49%, and Latino 36%. The rest are other races. Five of the current council members are white, and two are Latino. One is a woman. I called the mayor's office to ask if the council had been lily white before the change. As a result of explaining why I was calling, I had a chat with the mayor's very chatty and forthcoming secretary. <laughs> she identified herself as a Latina and said that she was, quote, disappointed for the city, unquote, with the settlement. She believes that Latinos now have less influence since they can only vote for one council member and cannot affect the other council races. Why would anyone give up their right to vote for all council members and vote for all the council seats to vote for just one, she asked. When I spoke with the mayor, he told me that the Modesto City Councils had been male, pale, and stale. <laughs> he himself is male and pale. He didn't comment on whether or not he was stale. <laughs> he supported the change because of the cost of elections. Santa Barbara's history has been quite different. Its council has not been all male, pale, or stale. 
1968, the voters of the city of Santa Barbara voted to end the district system in exchange for election at large of all city council members. The League of Women Voters, which strongly supported the change away from the district system, commented, one, city council members elected at large rather than from separate districts, while aware of local problems, make their decisions based on the needs of the community as a whole. Two, chances are better for well-qualified candidates and more of them, which has been proven to be true, to seek office when unhampered by artificial district boundaries. Three, citizens represented at large have access to six council members rather than just one. Four, under the district system, a voter cast a ballot for only one council member every four years. A city council elected at, at large gives every citizen the opportunity to elect three members of council every two years. D five and five, district representation tends to lead to decisions made not on the basis of their merits, but on swapping votes. You vote for what I want, or I won't vote for what you want. If you know, if the council member has some 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 chips to deal with. These comments are still valid. The worst part of district elections was that, except for the mayor, there wasn't anyone on the council whose major concern was the city as a whole. And the big issues aren't just related to neighborhood, individual parts of the city. Planning is citywide, considered in relationship of one area to another. Some of the big issues that have come before the city council um, may have physically affect only a small part of it. So, well, like the com completion of the Crosstown Freeway or the downtown revitalization, but it's an issue that affects everyone in the city and it needs to be they need to be considered as part of the city as a whole. By the way, one issue often mentioned is indicating the need for council members to be elected by district is the missing, missing bridge on Cacique Street. The, impl the implication is that if there was a council member for that district, that vehicle bridge would have long since been replaced. Well, the capital improvement budget was before the Planning Commission last Thursday, and when I saw that the a new pedestrian bridge was proposed for that crossing on Cacique, I said that I understood that people in the neighborhood wanted the br vehicle bridge replaced, especially given that Cacique now connects directly with Milpa Street. That seems like a good thing to do. Well, staff response showed that the issue is a bit more complicated. Several years ago, when the extension of Cacique Street under the freeway was being designed, staff reached out to the community and said, do you want the bridge replaced? Well, of course, the people who don't live on Cacique did. The people who do live on Cacique don't. Uh, they like their nice, quiet street, and they don't want it to keep it that way. And so that is why the bridge was not replaced. Remember that one council member from an individual district can't do anything by him or herself. At least three of their votes have to be garnered in support of whatever the person is promoting. Uh, and in zoning or general plan issues, it's four other votes. That, of course, is what happens now. Uh, but a change to district election, elections doesn't mean that magically council members from those districts are going to get what they want. Uh, it's been said that district elections would provide for greater opportunity for minority representation on the city council. That has not been true in Santa Barbara. There was just one Latino elected to the city council during the 45 years of district elections, and another was appointed to fill out a term. There have been four Hispa uh, Latinos and one black elected to the council during the 47 years of the at-large system, uh, including council member Kathy Murillo. Granted, that's not a high percentage, but Latinos can and do get elected. Uh, and actually, if the district that, if Santa Barbara goes back to district elections, the district that could be established that is majority Latino is pretty much the one that existed in when we had district elections before it centered around Franklin School in that neighborhood in the Lower East Side. And for many years, that district selected, elected a council member who was white. District elections do not lead to fairer or better representation. When people had their own council member, that council member was focused on issues in his or her own district. After all, that's where he or she was elected from, and, 
and rather than considering them in the context of the city as a whole. That does not lead to good governance. Uh, history shows that more people run for city council than ran under district elections. And back then, incumbents regularly ran without opposition. When I first ran for city council in 1975, there were 17 candidates for the three seats. Uh, and that was when the council only got paid $400 a month. <laughs> Curiously, uh, even though the council, one of the main reasons for putting a ballot measure on, the, uh, on giving council members a reasonable amount of money to make it possible for just about anyone to serve on the council, um, there have been fewer candidates. I don't understand that. Um, there there tend, to be, tend to be fewer. But, um, so I, I think to get more people to run for council, I, I agree with Ca Council Member Murillo's suggestion of an effect cultivating potential candidates by providing more opportunities for ser service on various boards and commissions. Uh, that's, that's a good direction to go. Getting people engaged in city issues is important, not, not only to get people where they might be willing to run for council or interested in running for council. Uh, it's part of what affects the turnout. And of course, voter registration and get out the vote is very important, whether it's the votes are in, the elections are in even or odd years. Some years ago, I compared voter turnout and talking about it in Santa Barbara with the turnout in cities with districts. It was higher in Santa Barbara. I don't know why. Perhaps that is because there is more choice and more sense of direct control of local government with the ability to vote for all council members. One supporter of district elections asserts that the period of district elections was a golden age of civic improvement. I don't think so. District elections did coincide with the reconstruction following the 1925 earthquake when many policies that were established that, to guide the city's development were established. But this was done by independent civic groups, not by the city council. It was an elected by district council which granted a variance that violated the city's own Hyde Ordinance over the protests of many. If three concerned citizens hadn't sued the council and won, there would be two nine-story condos where Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens are now. It was such community members that helped create the Santa Barbara we cherish, not, unfortunately, the city council. District election advocates assert that California is a Hispanic or Latino state. While at 40% of the population, whites are no longer the majority, neither are Latinos at 38%. That's statewide. I believe the present system works. Santa Barbara is small enough for each council member to know all of the city well. It's small enough for door-to-door -door campaigns. Latinos and people of color do get elected. Let's not disenfranchise ourselves and give up the power to choose all council members. Let's continue to have council members who are responsive to all city residents. There's an assumption underlying the Voting Rights Act. It is that Latinos always vote for other Latinos. That isn't true. In the last election in the Central Valley where almost all Latinos are Democrats and almost all whites are Republicans, almost all Latinos voted for white Gavin Newsom for uh, Lieutenant Governor, and almost all Republicans voted for Latino Abel Maldonado, the Republican, for <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. There was polarized voting all right, but it was on the basis of political party. Finally, those who filed the lawsuit might be careful what they wish for. In Modesto, in the presumably Latino district in the last election, a white Republican, a member of the board of the NRA, was elected to the, as council member from that district. I wonder how the Latinos in that district feel about him, but it doesn't matter. He is the only council member who represents them, and he's the only one who might be responsive to them. I bet that Latina secretary in Modesto City Hall is really feeling disenfranchised. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. You've given us 
So much good information to think about. I appreciate it very much, and I'm sure we all do, because these decisions are not made lightly. And I had the privilege of watching everybody's face sitting here at the table while you were talking. And I could see that each one was going, oh. <laughs> so I think you've given everybody a lot to think about. And it'll be interesting to see how all of this works out. Um, two questions for Sheila, and then we'll open it up. Uh, go ahead. Contrary to the period of districts being uh, the golden age, the one or two Latinos who had been elected during that period could not, for instance, swim in the public swimming pool except on Thursdays because on Fridays they drained the pool. The period, the period that you described of district elections was one when Santa Barbara was truly the home of the newlywed and nearly dead, when the white population was clearly in charge at a time when the notion of equality of races and God forbid sexes uh, was certainly not prevalent. Whereas the period beginning in the change to at-large elections came at a time of ferment both in the country as a whole and in the city of Santa Barbara, what with the oil spill, what with the, prop, the passage of uh, Prop 20 that created the Coastal Commission with the whole new environmental consciousness. All of those things resulted in the election of the first Latino councilman in many, many, many years, who was now a stimulus for this suit, Leo Martinez. He was elected as part of a slate with three white uh, members on it, all of whom got votes pretty close together because it was a slate. Mm -hmm. Leo got far fewer and barely squeaked by. That was the period of change in this community and when the change happened, it allowed Sheila yes. to get elected. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, you've been making a rather long statement. I'm not hearing a question. This was questions. Right. The question is, do you really believe that the period of uh, district elections before 1968 represents, a better, represents better opportunities for Latinos to be elected and to influence government? Where the attention has to be paid even though uh, things were, were different, as he said. Connie has the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my concern is that it looks as though it's very expensive to run for city council over the entire city. And normally candidates are raising around $80,000 now to run it all. And so this is very difficult for any minority to do, and I'm wondering, uh, I think part of what's motivating the push to districts is that it would be much less expensive to just walk one district and raise enough money to hand out flyers in a small district. I, I don't see how we're going to solve the money problem. Well, there, there have been efforts in the, on the council to establish some kinds of uh, campaign finance controls, but uh, those have gone by the, um, by the wayside. Um, you make a very good point. Uh, however, my own personal experience was that I, I spent as little as a third as my major opponents and still got elected. So it isn't necessarily how much money you spend. It, it, it's true, it would be easier to just do a district, but if you're going to do any radio or TV, even if you're just running in a district, um, it's, going to, it's going to cost. Okay. Fine. Did you want to say something, Shane? Yeah, I, I just want to plug into something. Uh, Connie raises an extremely important point, and that's the effect of money. And I think if you're considering going to even-year elections, which is there are a lot of good reasons to go to even-year elections, you have to take into consideration the need to spend money on media advertising and hence probably to be reliant 
on political campaign contributions from the usual organized suspects into, the, into that equation. It has, it has some effect if you've got to spend money you know, beyond your feet, you know, your shoe leather, getting your, getting your name out there. If you have to spend money on media buys, uh, it can have a significant effect uh, on municipal elections. I uh, call to your attention the 2009 election in which the, the growth limitation uh, measure was bundled with a slate of city council candidates and a tremendous amount of money was dumped into, in, in, into spent, I guess, if you want to be pejorative about it, was spent on, 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 a on a political campaign. And that's probably, I don't know how it cuts, but you got to take that into consideration. There are many difficult issues that we'll have to be all thinking about and addressing. We're just about out of time, but I do want to open it up two questions, general questions. So we'll run over a few minutes. And I see, Carol, you have someone back there who wants to ask a question. Thank you. One uh, further question for Sheila Lodge. And that is that you mentioned in your comments that it's been proven that the candidates weren't as high caliber under a district system. OK, well, you, you indicated, let, let, let's be clear. Okay, you, you indicated that the candidates under a district system were, were not as numerous and as qualified as the candidates that have been under an at-large system. And I'd just like you to comment that when the city of Santa Barbara had district elections in the past, there were only two-year terms, and there wasn't pay I mean, of any significance. So why would those concerns that existed 45 years ago necessarily be the case today? I did not say that there were less qualified candidates. What I said was there were fewer. And um, that's just the way the that, it, that it was, if you look back at the records. Um, there, where you do not have, and, and that was from what I'm regarding more qualified, it was more qualified candidates because where you don't have artificial boundaries, if you know Dick Smith lives next door to Mary Jones, and they're both great council candidates, but they're in the same district, they can't, um, you know, they, and they could they could run against each other. But why lose the opportunity to have capable people on the council simply because they live near one another? We did have a point on the council where Sid Smith, Gene Graffy, Lyle Reynolds, and there was a fourth council member that lived within five blocks of each other. But I don't, should, should some of them have been, been, been tossed off because I, they, they were close, lived close to one another? I think they were, well, I served with all of them, and I thought they were all very good council members who had the interests of the city at, at large as a whole foremost. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions for anyone else on our panel? Yes. Cheryl Rogers, OK. Cheryl Rogers. Um, I just have a brief comment. Um, based on uh, population trends, it looks like that the percentage of Latinos is increasing, and the percent, this is nationwide or maybe even statewide, um, is decreasing, the percentage of, of white are de is decreasing. So, I mean, if we make these changes now in 2015, uh, in another 10 years, uh, the picture could be different. I'm just making that comment. Your point's well taken. It will be very different in 10, 20 years, absolutely. And the majority will be very different. There's another question back here. I realize that the law requires that the districts um, have an even population. But what about the number of voters in each district? How will that turn out? Well, I, who knows? Who knows? Uh, I, I, let me point out one thing. It's really easy to register to vote in the state of California. You've got the motor voter law and outreach and all that. So not that hard to register to vote. You can undertake, in, in, in drawing district lines, you use general population according to the last census, unless there's a ballot measure on the city charter that prescribes a different method. 
voting age population, really, or voter registration, doesn't really enter into district lines too much, except with respect to assuring that all communities of interest, which I indicated before, their social and economic uh, groupings are, are adequately representative. But no, they don't. They don't consider registered voters. Uh, there is, for example, a dramatic difference, a dramatic difference in the number of registered voters in Santa Barbara's fifth supervisorial district, which includes Santa Maria, which if I understand right, has got about 20,000 registered voters, um, and the second district, which is uh, the west side of Santa, uh, west side of Santa, city of Santa Barbara, which has got about 60,000 registered voters in it, and that's, they've got equal population. So yeah, they, there can be dramatic differences, uh, but the only time that they're taken into consideration in the districting process is when you're uh, trying to accommodate and ensure adequate representation of all the various communities. Are there any other questions? Okay, it's a little after two o'clock. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you to everyone on the panel for sharing their thoughts, insights, and research. It's very important, thank you.